Olympics and wondered what it would be like to be an Olympian. Hi, I'm Sophia. And I'm Isaiah Alderay, and today we'll be talking about the often misunderstood culture of Olympic sense athletes. Everyone has a basic understanding of what the Olympic culture is and what it's like, <coughs> but in reality we only scratch the surface of what it really is. So today we're going to be talking about the history of the Olympics, the training and the preparation that goes into the Olympics, life during and after the Olympics. Okay, the history of the Olympics. The first ever recorded Olympics were taking place in 776 BC in Olympia, ancient Greece. Now that's where the uh, um, Olympics actually got their name, from the city where they first started. The Olympics started as a way to honor Zeus, the ruler of Mount Olympus, and later on were tied with religious events and other festivals. As of many things from the past, only men were able to participate in the Olympics. An interesting fact about the Olympics is that uh, back in the day, they were actually performed for me. They would often just oil themselves up and then dust themselves with sand in order to protect themselves from the sun. When the Olympics first started, there was actually only 12 games. It's crazy to think that right now there's over 50 games taking place. The first ever International Olympics occurred in 1896 and 13 nations participated. Later <coughs> on, another important date would be 1924, where the first uh, Winter Olympics took place, and lastly, 1960, where the first Paralympics took place. Now that we've talked about the uh, history of the Olympics, let's talk about the training that goes into it. Now, who's ever played a sport? Who's devoted their whole life to that sport? How many years? How many hours a week? <laughs> so most of your Olympi the Olympians now practice from anywhere from 25 to 40 hours a week. It's a full-time job right there. A good example of this would be Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps uses the 6 by 6 rule. 6 hours a week, 6 days a week. He averaged out to swim around 50 miles per week. It's crazy to think. I struggled to run a mile. Um, sorry. He, along with the training, there's also a very important part, which is the coffee and diet. His diet will actually be 12,000 calories a day. It's crazy. Some people, that's what they consume in a week. That would be, be enough calories for him to, to get all the nutrients and also to maintain shape. Along with recovery, which is a very important part of this. <coughs> Okay, now come the Olympics, we all know what happens in terms of competition. What are the Olympians doing when they're not competing? And when they're not competing, that's when, where the Olympic Village comes into play. So right here, it, this is the village that houses all the Olympians during this year's Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. Um, it's comprised of eight 15-story buildings and includes amenities to comfort every Olympian, such as a post office, a hair salon, uh, a food court, and even a McDonald's. And, uh, Natalie Coughlin, what is it like to live in this Olympic village? So Natalie Coughlin, in an interview with ABC, said that it's a lot like living at a college campus, except that everyone is competing for the biggest moment of their entire life. And interestingly enough, she compares an aspect such as the food court to high school as well. As in the, in the food court, a lot of people tend to form their groups, and when they form their groups, they only sit with that group and only talk to them, so it becomes a little bit intimidating. What isn't as intimidating is the romance. Okay, so that's the interaction. The romance is actually not usually talked about when it comes to Olympics, but it's pretty prominent when it comes to Olympic Village. <coughs> and in the Olympic Village, um, Olympic, Olympian Hope Solo, in an interview with People, says that there's a lot of sex going on. And surprisingly enough, Ryan Lochte puts the number at 70 to 75% also with the interview with, from People. And uh, neither of those are scientific numbers, but it shows that it can get a little bit wild in the Olympic Village. But regardless of that, it is a pretty interesting opportunity for these Olympic athletes to relate to each other and to relate to people with the same struggle as them and to put their differences aside and come together as different countries and really focus on what they like doing, which is competing and competing in the Olympics. And so that brings us to after the Olympics easily the most misunderstood aspect of the Olympics. 
It's easy to assume that the stardom and success that's thrusted upon these athletes will last a lifetime. But that's not always true. They deal with not only internal battles, but sometimes financial battles after the Olympics. And Olymp a good quote from Michaela Schiffin showing off the internal battles they'll face is in fact when she says, everything after the Olympics is just eh. So obviously, the high of competing in the Olympics is not something that really, you can really compete with in terms of anything in, in the real life. Now, that being said, Financially, that's a whole nother story. If you're not an Olympic gold medalist, or if you are an Olympic gold medalist, or a bronze medalist, any medalist, it doesn't mean you're free from the financial hardships that might face an Olympian. So, a notable name is Ronda Rousey. In Beijing 2008, she received a bronze medal for judo. That being said, she was living out of her Honda Accord months later, unable to afford rent. And now, if you're not a gold medal winner or a bronze medal or any, any medal, it's even harder. Because most of these athletes don't have a fallback because they put all their hours into training for their, their sports. They don't get a proper education or a job. But, like Ryan Lochte sums it up at the end, he says that when you stand on the, the Olympic podium in front of everyone representing 300 million people in your country, it's beyond price. So it is true that a lot of these Olympic athletes aren't doing it for the money, they're doing it for the passion, clearly. But it's also easy for him to say that considering he's one of the highest paid Olympians ever. Um, today we've talked about um, what it is to be an Olympian, the history of it, the preparation and the training that goes into it, the amount of devoted years that people put in just to represent themselves and their country and their sport the life during the Olympics, and also the life after the Olympics, and the struggles and hardships they go through to do what they love to do. But let's not forget all the hard work that goes into this. Next time we watch the Olympics, remember what these athletes go to, to represent their country, and also in a way represent you, because they also represent their countries, and sometimes ours.